Hello and welcome to Devil's Advocate. With the opposition trading its guns on the Prime Minister, we ask, what exactly did he know about the 2G scam and when? That's the key issue I should explore today with the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Montek Singh Aduwalia. Mr. Aduwalia, let me start with a general question before I come to specifics. Whilst no one would accuse the Prime Minister of corruption, there is a growing feeling that perhaps his response and handling of 2G was less than vigilant. Would you accept that? No, not at all. I think uh, those who say that have a mistaken notion of how cabinet government works. The prime minister is not micromanaging every decision before it's taken. So I think that 2G clearly became a problem. But I don't think that it became a problem because it was mishandled at the PMO level before all these decisions were taken. Before I come to specifics, you're saying to me that this widespread impression that the Prime Minister was less than vigilant is unfair and wrong, both. That's correct. All right. Let's then come one by one to the five instances where questions are asked about the Prime Minister's actions. To begin with, in 2006, why did he allow Dayanidhi Maran to persuade him not to make pricing part of the GOM that he had specifically set up for 2G. Many people believe that's when the problem began. I think this has been discussed uh, on a number of occasions. The GOM had much broader uh, uh, objectives. And you know, the specific issue of pricing uh, was already covered by a cabinet decision in 2003. I mean, the 2003 cabinet decision specifically said that the pricing issue will be resolved by the finance minister and the uh, telecom minister. Now, you cannot set up a GOM to look at something which has been decided at the cabinet level. I think if anybody felt that the previous cabinet decision needed to be reversed, they should have taken the matter to cabinet. But what I think Mr. Maran said was, look, this is not relevant in this case. There are systems that exist, and therefore it was taken out. So in the circumstances that prevailed in 2006, you're saying a GOM would have been redundant to handle pricing? No, no, there were other issues that the GOM had to deal with. But not pricing? The, yeah, because there was already a mechanism in place. And that mechanism had already sorted out how the matter would be handled? Well, I don't know that it had, it had indicated how it would be handled. Of course, it hadn't sorted out what would be done. That decision came much later. Now, the second instance where questions are raised about the Prime Minister's action comes in 2000 2007, when the law minister and the telecom minister had differences over how spectrum should be allocated. Why did the prime minister allow the telecom minister to dismiss the law minister's advice that this issue should go to a GOM? Well, I think the, it's true that I understand that the law minister did raise this issue. But actually, what had been referred to the law minister was a much narrower technical issue. So whether to go to a GOM or not is not automatic when two ministries disagree on an issue that doesn't concern the second ministry. So I think Mr. Mar Mr. Maran's view at that time was, or I think it was Mr. Raja's view at that time was, that the issues that had been raised by the law minister pertained to issues that were squarely within the realm of DOT going through the normal processes of telecom commission, etc., And he was not bound to go to cabinet because the law minister asked him to, because it's not an issue on which the law minister was concerned. So you're also saying to me that the argument that this was a breach of what's called the transaction of business rules of cabinet where when two ministers disagree the matter must go to cabinet for resolution. You're saying that interpretation is wrong, it doesn't apply? Well, I mean, I'm not the expert, but let me tell you my understanding. When two ministers disagree on issues that concern them, it is certainly true that it goes to cabinet. But when a minister is disagreeing with the ministry concerned on an issue that doesn't concern the ministry, which is disagreeing, then it doesn't actually go to cabinet. All right, a third area where questions are raised about the Prime Minister's behavior again pertains to 2007. Was he unaware of or did he ignore the fact that both the Finance Minister and the Finance Secretary were pressing for an auction rather than first come first serve and in addition the Finance Secretary in writing had raised serious questions about selling spectrum in 2007 at 2001 prices and had said that any decision to that effect should be stayed. Well, let me say, on the, this has been so much discussed. I don't know, for example, how much the PM knew when the discussions were going on. But what was brought to the PM's notice on the basis of material that has been revealed in the public regarding the auctioning decision is that the TRAI, 
after having gone through all these things, had come to the conclusion that auction is not the right route to follow for these uh, 900 megawatt and a few I mean, megahertz and a few other areas of spectrum, but it should be followed for 3G. So that the ministry took a view based on the TRAI recommendation. What about the But let me finish. I mean, I think the issue of pricing was always meant to be handled separately between the finance ministry and the uh, communications ministry. And in fact, a letter written by the finance secretary dated the 22nd of November 2007 specifically raises questions about selling spectrum in 2007 at 2001 prices, and the finance secretary actually said that decision should be stayed. Was the PM no, not no. aware of that? Uh, again, the, uh, this illustrates the fact that the mechanism was working and the two ministries were discussing with each other. I have no idea. There's no reason, by the way, why the fin Prime Minister should be aware of letters written by Finance Secretary to his colleague in communication. But what that letter does seem to suggest is that having accepted the issue that auctioning is not going to be done, you know, I, I want to clarify, by the way, we can always revisit in retrospect whether that was the right recommendation of TRAI, whether the government should have accepted, et cetera. But that was at a policy level. Having accepted that, what he was raising was, well, what should the price be? Should it be at 2001 prices? These discussions went on between the finance ministry and the communications ministry for the next several months. This was not an area where the PM should have been more alert or should have been intervening. You're not at all. I mean, look, if the PM were to get involved in every little disagreement there, I mean, he'd have no, no time whatsoever to do his own job. All right, a fourth area where questions are raised about the Prime Minister's behavior is when the Prime Minister in November on the 2nd, 2007, wrote to Mr. Raja, drawing his attention to a number of issues, he asked Mr. Raja to exercise fairness and transparency, but he didn't thereafter follow up to monitor and check that his advice had been heeded. Shouldn't he have made that extra effort to check that his advice was being followed? Well, let me say that, uh, again, this is in the public domain. He raised the issue because the issue had been raised in public, brought it to the minister's notice. The minister subsequently responded and assured him that he was following the established policy. And there were some departures which I think he brought to the attention of the PM and said that this had the support and approval of the Solicitor General. Now, in an environment like that, and remember, if something wrong or unfair is being done by a ministry, people affected take the matter to court, they protest, I don't think that the Prime Minister should be behaving as the super minister supervising everything that his colleague does. But so in my view, he raised these issues, he got an assurance from the ministry that they were following established policy and that it had been approved by the solicitor. So general. wasn't there a need to just monitor and check that his advice to be cautious, to be transparent, to be fair, was actually implemented. That extra yeah. monitoring didn't happen. But that, that's not, in my view, the way cabinet government works. Okay. I mean, the fact of the matter is there are multiple double checks going on. And aggrieved parties take ministries to court. I mean, had something gone wrong, it would have surfaced. I think he brought it to the notice of the minister. And the important thing is that the ministry responds saying, yes, we are following established policy. I think when the ministry responds like that, if the Prime Minister keeps monitoring, I mean, then we are not running a, a cabinet government. We are, we, are, we are running something micromanaged from In the Prime words, Minister's In other words, the office. Prime Minister is not a headmaster or school teacher who has to keep checking on homework. I think that's absolutely correct. Fifth, and perhaps in a sense this is most important of all, when in December on the 26, 2007, Mr. Raja wrote to the Prime Minister to say, that he intended to implement first come, first serve, not in terms of the date of application, which was the agreed conventional way of implementing it, but in terms of a new criteria which it seems he, Raja, had devised, i.e. in terms of compliance with the letter of intent, it was quite clear that Mr. Raja was already indicating that he was fiddling or changing the rules. And the Prime Minister didn't object. Was it because the Prime Minister didn't spot what Raja was doing, or he didn't care? Well, let me say that that's the letter I was referring to. The letter comes and Mr. Raja gave a reason why he had to depart from the traditional rule because in the past uh, applications were treated one after the other, whereas here a number of applications had piled up and therefore if everybody was going to get a letter of intent on the same day, 
how do you determine seniority? Now, whether the procedures were fair, whether people got enough time, there have been a lot of issues raised, and they're all sub judice. I don't want to comment on those. But the important thing is what the Prime Minister got was an assurance that policy is being followed, except in a certain area, some change is necessitated, and this has the approval of the Solicitor General. And now, I'm aware that people have. I mean, there's an issue of whether there were changes made after the Solicitor General's comments, etc. I don't know. And that's all something that will come out but of But as you said, here the change was necessitated because there was a whole lot of applications that had to be processed at one go, not as was the case previously, yes. applications coming exactly. one after another. As a result of this, Mr. Raja, or the Prime Minister rather, thought it was okay for Mr. Raja to change from date of application to compliance with letter of intent. He saw no problem in that. Well, I, 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 I don't know what went on in the PMO, but th what the PM would have been told is that he's saying he's following the policy except where some change is necessary, and this has the approval of the Solicitor General. Now, I think when you're faced with that, uh, to micromanage that decision is going a little too far. Finally, there is a note on the Prime Minister's files dated the 22nd of January 2008, put there by the Prime Minister's private secretary, which says that the Prime Minister would like the PMO to be kept at arm's length. In the light of the five points that have been through meticulously one by one, many people believe that this desire to be kept at arm's length is either proof that the Prime Minister was washing his hands off the whole 2G affair, or worse, he was actually looking the other way. Well, it's true that this item of news has been played up quite a bit, but it is one of the most gross misrepresentations of the fact. The facts are actually extremely ob straightforward. That noting was recorded, I've seen the papers, that noting was recorded on an internal proposal which had come up from the PMO, suggesting a particular way of handling the problem so that all the legacy issues are taken care of and maybe some sensible pricing is done. Now, what the Prime Minister recorded was, or rather directed, and what the uh, noting records, is that this should be shared informally with the DOT. I mean, remember, the DOT is looking at this issue. The Pri Finance Ministry and the DOT are talking about it. What the Prime Minister said was, share it informally with the DOT. We should not be directly involved because you can't have a direction coming from the Prime Minister. And the reference to at arm's length, is simply let us be at arm's length with regard to such a proposal. It does not say that something going on in the DOT which may or may not be good, let's stay at arm's length. That's the, pres that's the interpretation okay. that has been placed on I've it, but it's heard, quite wrong. I've heard your explanation, but the opposition, who also read the Prime Minister's press release, turned around and say, the Prime Minister may not have been at arm's length, but he wasn't hands-on. Worse still, they say, at critical moments, he either took his eye off the ball or he deliberately shut his eyes to what was happening. I think this, this whole business of hands-on is there are innumerable ministries making decisions. The idea that the Prime Minister must be watching over the shoulders of every ministry goes completely against uh, any kind of principle of how cabinet government should work. I think it's the job of the Prime Minister to give broad directions to be reassured that the ministers are doing the right thing. And let me say on the specific issue of pricing, which is what that note refers to, I'm sure they were aware that this is being discussed between the finance ministry and the DOT and hadn't yet been resolved. You've raised the critical issue of pricing. That is part of a series of concerns the opposition have. I'm going to take a break and come back and put to you the opposition charge against the prime minister, central to which is this issue of pricing. We'll be back in a moment's time. See you after the break. Welcome back to Devil's Advocate and an interview with the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Montek Singh Aluwalia. Mr. Aluwalia, let's come to the case the opposition make against the Prime Minister. Arun Jaitley has gone on record to say that in each of the three important cases where Raja is in court, Mr. Raja had either informed the Prime Minister and therefore he was fully in the loop, or the Prime Minister had given Mr. Raja advice which Raja had ignored and the Prime Minister hadn't monitored. And to begin with, the key issue Jaitley raises is to do with pricing. He says that in the Prime Minister's letter of November the 2nd, 2007 to Raja, the Prime Minister had asked him to consider the revision of entry fee, which is currently benchmarked on old spectrum auction figures. Raja didn't do that. And the Prime Minister either didn't check, or if he checked and found out he didn't worry, 
and this issue of pricing became a problem thereafter. Do you think the Prime Minister should have been more careful? Well, I, you know, as I said before, the pricing issue was to be determined after discussions between the Ministry of Communications and the Ministry of Finance. And as I recall, those discussions went on for several months afterwards. You know, the UAS license on which the entry fee is given doesn't actually give you the spectrum. I mean, the spectrum is given subsequently based on the mobile wireless license and spectrum gets allocated. So the whole issue of pricing potentially was still open. And it's not, I think, until July of, uh, of, the, of the year 2008 that a final decision was taken based on an agreed position presented to the Prime Minister except, by the two ministries. Except that if a final position was taken in July 2008 and the actual licenses were awarded in January 2008, then in fact that final decision was taken almost six and a half, seven months after the decision happened. No, no, it was but a sort of retrospective no, no, validation. No, no, pricing of spectrum can be changed independent of the entry license. And there is an issue here. The issue really is, and this was the argument being made at the time, that the TRAI, which is after all our regulatory body, had given a very clear recommendation after weighing all these things that we should continue for level playing field purposes with the system that we're doing. Quite I right. think it's still possible to argue that pricing of spectrum should have been changed. That could have been done ah, ah, in this July, is, this even is, after the license. This is a very important point you're making. It is still possible to argue that pricing of spectrum could have been changed. That, in a sense, is also the advice the PM was giving, but that advice wasn't acted on. Was that one area where well, the PM should have been more vigilant? No, no. Let me, let me say that, you know, uh, the decision of the cabinet of 2003 refers this matter to the two ministries. I think what the prime minister needed to do was to assure himself that the two ministries had reached an agreement. That agreement made some changes, by the way, in the uh, revenue so in other share, words, et cetera. The July 4th, and the July 2008 agreement validates the f and excuses any lack of action by the PM. By the PM, certainly. I mean, because after all, you've got the two main okay. ministries coming with an agreement. My last but I, w I want to add one more thing here. It is very important to recognize that that agreement actually also made the decision that 3G spectrum will be auctioned. You know, take a look at the policy as a whole. Quite right. But 3G While they is didn't a, but do but it... 3G is a different matter. Let's I know, but 3G. people are not recognizing that the 3G auction was a dream auction. Okay. Clean, but totally let's, transparent. Let's, 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 let's leave 3G out. Let's Progress stick to 2G. Progress takes place that way. Let's You've got a legacy issue But let's here. stick to 2G. Let's stick to 2G. My final question. Even on this critical question of advancing the cutoff date and changing it arbitrarily from the 1st of October to the 25th of September, Mr. Raja, in his letter of November 2007, had informed the Prime Minister that was precisely what he intended to do. Not only did the Prime Minister not object, he didn't even ask any questions about it. Well, look, the, these, as I say, these are matters of detailed implementation of policy when you're giving licenses. It's a reasonable assumption that in all these matters, there's a legal consultation that's going on. I don't think it's the job of the Prime Minister to second-guess everything. Not even to ask questions about arbitrary change of cut-off dates? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those... I could make the following argument, that if a, if a cut-off date is arbitrarily changed, those affected have the right to go to court. There is that process. When, if there was a problem, it would surface. But shouldn't the in Prime Minister respect, anticipate look, in, there's in, a legal problem happening and just no, ask no, questions? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not judging for the moment, by the way, whether what was done was right, because that's subject of a judicial uh, process. I don't believe at that time that this is the job of the Prime Minister to be checking this. Okay. I mean, there's an entire machinery and their job to, to make sure they do a good job. You can't expect... Look, today what is happening is hundreds of letters go to the Prime Minister, I'm sure, alleging wrongdoing everywhere. If the Prime Minister were to become responsible for personally ensuring that this doesn't happen, he would simply have no time to do anything at all. I've heard your explanation. The audience will have heard your explanation. But there still will be many people who say that the case that the Prime Minister knew or should have suspected that Raja was up to no good seems almost compelling. And the fact that the Prime Minister didn't intervene sounds and looks like either lack of vigilance or worse, negligence. How do you handle that impression? Has the PM lost the battle of perceptions? Well, look, I think perceptions are changed by people looking at the facts, by having a fair debate, maybe by television looking at both sides of the thing. There's no doubt, by the way, that this is a problem. I mean, it's there before the courts. 
But nobody is saying, and that's something for the courts to decide. The limited point I'm making is, is that to think that this should have been the business of the PM to make sure at every step that nothing wrong was done, I mean, on that basis, no, no wrong would ever be done in the government except by the PM himself, because you're going to hold every, everything the PM does, uh, everything that happens should have been subjected to oversight, micromanagement by the Prime Minister. That is not the job of the Prime Minister. Look, if something wrong happened, we should find out whether it was wrong and take appropriate action. That's what's going on. Okay. But to blame the Prime Minister is just totally misjudging the situation. Mantek Singh Aluwalia, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.